Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. All right, so... Today, we are going to be talking about Revelation. We have been in a series on Revelation. Last week, we spent some time in Ephesus. Um, and if you're a visual person, this map might help a little bit. Uh, Ephesus is the red circle, um, furthest on the left and furthest down. I know you can't really see the writing on that very well, but that was Ephesus. And last week, Eric explained that John, the disciple, one of the disciples of Jesus, wrote to Ephesus, and these are all Jesus' words coming, and he explained that they were doing some really good things. They actually had really good deeds, they were actually great people, but yet it wasn't enough because they weren't doing those things for the right reasons. They didn't love Jesus in those things, and we learned about that last week. And this week, we're going to be spending some time in the red circle right above Ephesus, which is Smyrna. Um, and the blue one, um, just down to the left, is the island of Patmos. Um, and if you remember, that is the island that John is writing from. So John the disciple, he's the one writing this. He is in that island of Patmos. So we're going to be spending our time uh, talking about the Christians in Smyrna today. Um, and to do that, let's first start by talking about running. And when I think, when some of you hear the word running, you're like, I don't ever run, right? Unless I'm being chased by something ferocious. Or maybe if I stepped out of the house and the ice cream truck missed me signaling, I may run after it then, right? Those are the times in which I run and that is about it, right? We, we have those ideas. And uh, me, me and my wife, when we were dating, we decided to uh, spend time together by running, and we wanted to do a half marathon together, because we would have to spend a lot of time training together. And for those of you who are wondering if you should do that, I would not suggest ever training for a half marathon. It's the worst thing ever, except for with my bride. It was great. So... <laughs> We, we started training for this, this half marathon. It was the Holland Haven, and it took all summer, right? It's just over 13 miles, and we had to start training with one mile and then two miles, and it took a ton of time when you start adding eight miles and nine miles. It took a ton of training and a ton of perseverance, and it was actually really hard, and it was a struggle, but we were able to finish, and that finish was so good. Right, it was one of those where you're like, I can check that off my list. I've accomplished a half marathon. We were exhausted by the end. And I remember some people after you cross the finish line kind of running up to you. You okay? Are you all right? Do you need like someone to stretch you out or give you a massage? And I'm like, I'm all sweaty. I don't want anyone touching me right now. Please stay away from me. But it was that accomplishment, right? It was so good to have that victory. See, there's training and there's perseverance. There's mental toughness when it comes to something of that distance or something that long. But that victory is what we think about. Has anyone run the riverbank before, the riverbank run? Uh, not, not too many of you. How many of you have uh, ran that race to win it? You're like, I'm going to go and win it. Right? None of you. Right, it, it, a one, Phil. Phil is going to win that race. Right, no one, no one goes in into that race thinking that they're going to win it. Right, they go into it to get that finisher medal at the end. Right, they get everyone gets handed this finisher medal, and it's not just a everyone gets a trophy. The the first place gets a great trophy, and so on. But that finisher medal is what people want because it is an accomplishment to finish something like that. People aren't going to win it. They're going to finish something like that. See, the Christians in Smyrna have a very similar race that they're running. It's a really hard race, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit more today. And it has been a journey for them. This race has been a crazy journey. And they have people all around them, all the people telling them that they should give up. It isn't worth it, that they shouldn't be doing these things. See, I ran cross country uh, when I was a senior in high school, and I just had a blast. I had a lot of fun. And um, if you know anything about cross country, you know that the tracks um, kind of weave in and out, go into fields and through the woods. And there's many different points 
in cross country where parents or coaches can go and cheer on and they can run from one point to the next and kind of see you at three or four different points in the race. Um, and my parents would go to a lot of these. My coaches would go from point to point. And I remember just the encouraging uh, words coming from my parents at each point. But at the end, before I knew where the end was, my dad would set up about 150 yards before the end. And when I saw him, he'd start encouraging, you're almost done. You're almost there. Pour it on. This is it. The finish line is just around the corner. Like, and that was the encouragement I needed to get to the end. Right? I want you to think about, as we read from this passage in Revelation, that same tone of a dad saying, you're almost there. Hang on. Hold on a little bit longer. So read these words with me from Revelation 2, 8 through 11. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now picture with me here. A weary, worn-out Christian, just at life's end, they don't know if they can make it any farther. And the Savior is there whispering these words to them. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. So this is being written to the church of Smyrna. And it's helpful to know some of the history around this church in this specific area. Um, in, in 23 AD, so Smyrna in 23 AD, they were actually, many of these cities were struggling with the idolatry of gods, of different gods. But Smyrna wasn't actually struggling with that. They were actually kind of moving on to the, the glorification of their emperor. Okay, so the Caesar was Lord, was starting to come out. And in 23 AD, Smyrna won the privilege of kind of having a temple built for their emperors, for these Caesars that they would worship. They were no longer having trouble worshiping all these gods of the suns and all this type of stuff, but they would worship the emperor, the Caesars. So Smyrna built this. And they were actually one of the leading cities in that area, in that day and age, that was moving towards the worship of emperors. And the Roman emperor Domitian, so he came on the scene around uh, 80 AD to like 95 AD and was the first emperor to actually demand worship of himself to these people. So this book was written somewhere in the early 90s AD. So this is exactly what's happening. The church of Smyrna has been living this life under an emperor, under a Caesar who demands worship of himself. See, and the ch this is the church that Jesus is speaking to. And if these Christians do not obey, they are persecuted, they're tortured, many of them are thrown into a beast of wa a den of wild beasts and get just persecuted. They they're uh, not given jobs. Jobs are often taken from Christians because they weren't saying that Caesar is Lord. And this is the church that Jesus is writing to. And he says these words, I know your works, your tribulations, your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. So what Jesus is saying, he knows your works. And if you were here last week, we talked about the works of Ephesus and how great their works were. Their deeds were fantastic, but that wasn't enough. They didn't love Jesus. But we find that the church in Smyrna, the Christians there, do actually love Jesus. Because they're even dealing with tribulation. See, and what I love about this is Jesus says, I know your tribulation. And we often don't think that Jesus had this journey, that he had this race going on too of life when he was living on earth. We don't 
we often have this idea of Jesus as godly, right? That is the only picture, but we don't often think that he was also fully human and fully God. That when he was a kid, that he was probably mocked and made fun of for the situation he got brought up in, right? He was born to a virgin, right? No one believed that when when he was in Nazareth. No one knew what was happening there. He was probably mocked, and we don't think about Jesus as having that kind of a childhood, right? He was fully human. So when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane praying on the last night before he was betrayed, his friends deserted him and fell asleep while he was asking them to pray deeply for him. Right? He knew the pain and the suffering of what it was like to have friends disappear when he needed them most. See, Jesus knew what suffering meant when he was brought in in front of the council and tortured and lashed and mocked and spit on. He knows the suffering. He knows tribulation. So when it says, I know your tribulation, it's not just type that you, you can see it, right? I see what you're going through, and that must be tough. No, Jesus has lived this journey, right? He's run this race. He's run this course already. He knows what it's like. So he knows tribulation. But he also knows the poverty. He says he knows that. And Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, was actually a pretty poor town, Right? As, a, as a worker there, you wouldn't make very much. It wasn't a, pros, a prosperous town. There wasn't, he saw lots of poverty. Jesus knows the poverty, and that is what he's telling these group of people. So what did Jesus call the Christians in Smyrna to do? Right? What does he ask them to do? He says this, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you in prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. See, maybe there's some of you in this room today that need to hear those words. All right, Jesus says, I know your pain. I know your tribulations. I know the sufferings. I know, I know, I know. But I'm here. I've been there hold on a little bit longer. See, in the church of Smyrna, there was a guy by the name of Polycarp. And Polycarp had a teacher by the name of John. And we've talked about John already today. John was the disciple of Jesus. And not only was John the disciple of Jesus, but he was one of the inner three that Jesus would call probably one of his best friends. James, John, and Peter were the inner three. So, John spent tons of time with Jesus. And one of John's disciples, the very person who's writing to, from Patmos, um, is, is Polycarp. Okay, so this Polycarp guy has an eyewitness of what Jesus has done. So he, he knows what's happening with Jesus. So John planted uh, this guy, this Polycarp guy, in the church of Smyrna. So We know what's happening in the church. There's persecution, and Polycarp is fighting against that persecution. He knows what's coming. He knows the risks that it takes to being a Christian in Smyrna. And at one point, Rome decides that they're getting too sick of what these Christians are doing. And they bring Polycarp in to kind of their main area, and they say, we need you to say Caesar is Lord. Otherwise, we're going to kill you. Right? That, that is not something that was very uncommon in that day and age. And Polycarp explains, no, I, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. There is no other God but Jesus. Caesar is not my Lord. And the main guy who was running the trial at that point said, you know, it's going to be a whole lot easier for you if you just say Caesar is Lord. See, it's fascinating. Actually, all that Christians had to do in the church of Smyrna is kind of burn a small pinch of incense in the temple of Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord, and then they would get a certificate saying that they had done those things, and then they could go back to worshiping Jesus. Right? It's kind of fascinating. That's all that he had to say. That's all he had to do. And yet Polycarp says, no. That's hypocrisy. I am only saying that Jesus is Lord. I'm not going to just get that certificate so that I can praise his name later. 
he is not going to say Caesar is Lord. So the proconsul at that point tells him, okay, if that's what you choose, then we are going to light you on fire. You are going to burn for these words. And Polycarp explains to him that the, the fires that he would endure on earth were only, were only going to happen for a little time. Right? But the fires of an eternal punishment would be eternal. So you, he explained that they have no idea of what's going to come if he says that Jesus is not Lord. So he was put to the torch, and as they were lighting it, he says, Jesus is Lord. And he died for those words. He died for those things, and he paid, for his, paid with those words for his life. But why, why did Polycarp do that? Right? Why did he risk everything? Because it only took a few words and a pinch of this incense and then things could go away and he could start living his normal life. Right? Why did he do those things? See, Polycarp knew Jesus. And he knew what Jesus had to offer. offer. See, Polycarp ran the race. But not only did he run the race, he trained for that race. See, when the soldiers came to his house to arrest him before they put him on trial, the soldiers came in and Polycarp actually offers a ton of hospitality for them. He offers them food, feel free to sit down for a little bit, you've had a journey to get here, and he just asks them one thing, may I pray for an hour, right? Polycarp, we we don't know if Polycarp knew what was coming, but regardless of what time it was, he was training for this. Right? He trained and he knew what training would take. To run the race, to run the race well, it often includes three things. Right? Training, perseverance, and then the end part of the race is always the victory. Right? There's a crown at the end. So let's talk about training for a little bit. See, why do we train? Right? Why do we, we put ourselves through the training? Why can't we just go out and run the race? Right? Training actually increases our chances of finishing, doesn't it? See, I think some of you might be able to sign up for a 25K and just go out and run it. You may feel like death for a week after, but it might be possible to go out and run that race, right? But training, if we can train for months and months, that increases our chances of finishing, right? I remember when we were training and actually running the half marathon We knew it was getting really hard. Trust me, at mile 9, 10, it was like, is this actually worth it? Right? But we knew that we had trained. So we knew that we could do it. If we train, we know we can finish. Students in high school, I want to talk to you guys specifically for a moment. Because there's going to be a time, if you're a senior, it's going to come really quickly. And if you're a freshman, you have a few years before this. But there's going to be a time when you leave the house. And you go off to school or you go off to work. And you have your own house or apartment. And now is the time to train for those moments. Because those moments, you are going to be tested. Your faith is going to be tried. There are going to be people and professors and co-workers that come up to you and say, no, Jesus is not Lord. He is not the one that is going to save you. That Doing these things actually is. And you are going to be tested more than you ever have in your past. And now is the time to be training. You see, we train so we can run the race well. So how do we train? How do we do those things? Well, it takes time, doesn't it? Right for the half marathon, me and my wife trained all summer long for this race. It's not just a one time and done. It's not, if we think about our spiritual lives, it's not just getting in the word and reading for three minutes and then moving on and saying, yep, I think I've done good enough. That's a good start. Three minutes is a great place to start, but it's not the end. Right? Training means you keep pushing yourself to be better and better and better. See, there's training, but there's also perseverance in a race. Right? Short runs are fine. Like to the mailbox, you can make it there and back without training. Most of you are like, yep, I can do that. Don't ask me to do any more. But if we want to do any more, we require that perseverance. See, we can move past short moments of pain. 
Right? We can get past some of those things, but it's the longer moments of pain that will really test our faith. It's moment, moments like watching a loved one pass away before you were ever expecting them to. It's moments when you're put to the test of your faith and someone who's smarter and wiser is qu- making you question what you actually believe. It's the moments when you've been asking for something for so long and it's not ever happening. Right? But if we've trained, then we can have the perseverance of finishing the race of when, when our faith is truly tested. Right? It's that training. It's the perseverance. Again, that, that half marathon, we knew that we could finish, right? There was a moment in that 8 to 10 mile mark where we had to choose if we were going to persevere through that pain. It was a struggle because it was the Holland Haven. So as you get towards the end of it, it gets up into Grand Haven where it gets really hilly, right? It was in those moments that we had to decide if we were going to persevere through that pain for the finish. It'd be a, a whole lot easier just to be, oh, I think we can be done here. Let's just call this good enough. Let's just be done. Right? But it's the perseverance of pushing through those moments. See, the church of Smyrna had Jesus speaking to them in these very moments. Right? They had years of being forced to choose between their jobs and saying Jesus or, and Caesar is Lord. Right? They had moments where they had to choose between, is this worth my life? Is saying Jesus is Lord worth the torture and mockery and the potential of us living in poverty? I love how James 1, so uh, earlier in the New Testament, James 1 verse 2 says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind. That's interesting, right? It continues, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Training will push you through that perseverance. See, what you know is that you don't just start training for a race and start running 10 or 12 miles a day, right? You don't start running that amount right at one time. You start with three miles. And then after a week, you add four miles and then five miles and then six miles, and then all of a sudden you're running eight to ten miles with the same amount of energy that it used to take to get to three, right? Training will slowly add up so you can persevere farther and farther, and there's the end, right? There's the victory of crossing that finish line, but to get there, it takes the mental toughness, Right, there's a study that was done in 2012 that put two cyclists against computers. Okay? One of them was told that <clears throat> their computer competitor uh, was actually their personal best, their PR, their personal record. But that racer, the computer, was actually just a little bit faster than that record was actually. So he was, he was training and he was actually cycling against something faster than he's ever been before. And then the person on the right was told, your competitor um, is actually quite a bit faster than you. You have never beat this time before. And when the two racers started, they realized that this racer actually never stood a chance. He had the mindset that he was never going to win. He was never going to be able to catch up to that competitor. And he was just blown by. He wasn't even close. But the competitor on this side that was told, This is your best record. You have gotten this before. Even though that it exceeded it, he actually propelled and beat that competitor. So he beat his best time ever. Because he was told that he was going to be able to win. See, part of training and part of perseverance is the head game of knowing that you can do it. Right? That's the head game that we were telling ourselves in that half marathon that we were going to be able to do this. We've trained for this. We can accomplish this. Right? To the church in Smyrna, Jesus was telling them, you can do this. I know what you're going through. I know what you've been through. You can do this. So you may be asking, is it worth it? Right? Is this pain worth it? Can we actually finish this? Let me give you a hint about the end. 
Because we know, we have the Bible, we know what the end looks like, and we know who is one in the end. Jesus wins in the end, right? Satan does not overcome. Jesus is the victor, right? So that makes living our lives so much easier when we think about the cyclist on this side who knew that he could beat it, right? We know in this life that we win, Jesus wins in the end, and we have a fighting chance because of those things. And we have the mental, we'll have the mental endurance because we know that the ending is in our favor if we're a follower of Jesus. See, part of training and perseverance and the victory is all about the head game. But that head game doesn't become nearly as much of an issue if we know who wins in the end. See, 2 Corinthians 4 says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. If you are faithful to him, you will get that finisher medal. Right? Think back with me to the Riverbank Run. Right? They just go for the finisher medal. It's not about first, second, or third. That, that doesn't matter to them. It's about finishing in the end. And we know that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that we get those finisher trophies regardless of how hard it was during the race. See, Jesus, I love that Jesus uses these metaphors to the church of Smyrna. The idea of a victor, he even uses the language of the crown of life. And this church is so used to athletics being the big, big deal, right? There were tons of athletics that they were always giving out trophies and medals and pushing forward because of those things. And Jesus says, I know what those things are, but this crown of life is so much better than anything that this world can offer you. See, Jesus knows If you hear anything from today's message, if you're suffering in any way or know that you will be at some point because of your faith, understand this, that Jesus knows. Not just because he can see it happening, but because he has ran the race before us. You know what's great? Is that the crown isn't given out halfway through. At the riverbank run, there isn't someone at mile 15 saying, hey, you made it pretty far, here's a finisher medal. Right? That, that doesn't happen. It's at the end of the race. It's at the end where we have to make it to to get that crown of life. But there is victory. We, we know the truth. We know what Christ has to offer, and that's the victory in the end. So the question is, and I want to land with this today, is, uh, is it worth it for you? Are you going to hold out a little bit longer? Is this journey, is this suffering, is whatever you're going through worth it all? See, there's going to be pure joy at the end, right? Every runner has that as they're going up across the finish line. Some of them just collapse because they've given it their all. But there's this pure joy when you cross the finish line knowing you've put it all on the table, right? You haven't lived a life that was just mediocre, right? You didn't just walk through life, but you ran the race and you ran as hard as you could and you finished knowing that Jesus was on the other side ready to give you that crown of life, right? That crown of accomplishment, The question is, are you going to keep running even if it gets hard? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the way you spoke to John in the island of Patmos and explained that you know how hard life is sometimes. And I thank you that we can look at our own lives as we look at the church in Smyrna and see how the struggles that we have are not too big for you because you know what we're going through. And I ask that as we think about our lives that you help us push forward and move through life knowing that you're there for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, Click the link below in the description box. There's where you will find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. 
I hope this message has been encouraging but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.